Hi, my name is Linda Abraham, and I am the president and founder of Accepted, as well as the moderator for today's webinar. Welcome to your three-part game plan to dominate the GRE, to be, to be presented by Brett Etheridge, founder of Dominate Test Prep, which provides online test prep for the GMAT, GRE, SAT, and ACT. Today's exclusive focus is the GRE. Now, all of you here, because all of you are here rather because you get it. You understand the importance of the GRE in the grad school application process. And you are wisely getting information now so that you can quickly start your test prep and be ready to start your application ASAP. Hat tip to you all. Before I turn the mic over to Brett, I wanna mention a few housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of the webinar today. Brett, Brett may ask a few questions during presentation and ask you to raise your hand in response. You can do so by clicking on the hand icon, two icons underneath the horizontal orange arrow on your control panel. Now, as usual, we're looking forward to answering all your questions and we've set aside time for Q&A. So feel free to post any questions that you may have in the question window and we'll review the questions submitted and choose those that have, cho those that have the broadest application. When you leave, you're going to receive a brief survey. Please, please fill it out. We value your feedback, and we use it to decide on new webinars or improve existing ones. Now, at this point, I'd like to test your hand-raising skill. Please raise your hand if you are here because you want to earn a super high GRE score, get into a top graduate program, and pursue the career of your dreams. Raise your hand if that's your reason for attending tonight. Okay, great. You're here for the right reasons. All of you are here for the right reasons and figured out how to raise your hand using uh, GoToWebinar. It gives me great pleasure at this point to introduce our presenter, Brett Etheridge. After graduating from Duke University with a degree in public policy, Brett spent two years in Madagascar doing community health education with the U.S. Peace Corps. Upon his return to the States, he helped launch a PR marketing firm in Washington, D.C., before heading to business school where he earned a master's in international finance from the University of Denver. While in school, he caught the entrepreneurial bug. In addition to founding Dominate Test Prep, Brett also operates successful nutrition and stock trading businesses. He is a huge Duke basketball fan, an avid tennis player, and a budding CrossFit athlete. Brett is also proud to be an associate member of the Association of International Graduate Admissions Consultants, or AGAC, and Accepted is delighted to be hosting this webinar for Dominate Test Prep. Brett, the floor, or should I say the mic and screen, are all yours, or at least they will be as soon as I transfer them to you. Wonderful, thank you, you very much. Choose what to share. All right, yeah. hello everybody. And I'm actually going to click on my webcam quickly. Just to say a quick hello, I wanna make sure, uh, just this, this is per, as personal as possible. I see, oh, just as I was sharing my video camera, I think a poll is up on the screen. So go ahead and uh, answer this poll question. It'll help me kind of understand my audience a little bit better and get to know you guys a little bit. And thank you for that introduction, Linda. Linda and I actually okay. met at an AGAC conference a number of years ago and have stayed in communication and done some work together ever since then. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be on with you again, Linda. And I'm excited to share all of this information with you guys you know, this three-part game plan to dominate the GMAT or the GRE, ultimately that is what we are striving for. And that's really my intention for you. My intention is for you to leave with really practical, tangible information, not only to help you get more right answers on the GRE, I'm gonna get actually very practical and share some good strategies with you to help you do that, but also to present kind of a big picture overview of the mindset that you need as you start preparing for the GRE, what you can be doing on your own to put yourself in the best position to get more right answers on test day so that you can go out and dominate the GRE. So, so that's what we're about. I'm excited to get started quickly looking at the poll results. Okay, most of you are just getting started, so that's great. And the first half of this you know, presentation tonight is gonna be geared specifically to you, but even the back half is gonna be really important that's where you're going to want to take some notes and then maybe come back to it as you really dive a little bit deeper into your prep, start doing more practice problems and homework problems. 
um, because if you haven't really seen a whole lot of what's on the GRE, some of what I talk about, you know, in terms of specific questions may or may, may not make sense to you, but that's okay. For the rest of you who have already been preparing, my guess is you're here because you've been preparing and you want to know how to kick it up to the next level, right? How to take it to the next level, maybe improve your preparation, make sure you're doing the right things. All right, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and dive in. I'm going to actually stop sharing my videos simply because it takes up a lot of bandwidth. And so I just want to make sure that um, nothing kind of uh, gets glitchy with the presentation itself. And then maybe when we come back for the Q&A, I'll come back on so you can see me. I wish I could see all of you guys and really connect with you. So for that, Definitely use the chat area because I will be able to see any sort of questions that come in. And if, if it's something that I can actually answer as I'm going through, I will. But for now, let's go ahead and dive in. You know, what, what is the GRE? <laughs> I, I, love this, uh, I love this little cartoon because I think it, it kind of sets the stage, right, for, for what we're all about. My aspirations to be a Buddhist monk were dashed when I failed the monastic aptitude test. You know, I don't, I don't think there is such a thing. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek cartoon. But the reality is it does seem like there's a standardized test for everything. And the standardized test that you guys are in store for as you think about going back to graduate school or business school or even now increasingly law school, you have to take this thing called a GRE. You know, I was actually going back and forth with a, a student on my YouTube channel who responded to one of my videos and, and literally said, you know, the GRE is stupid. You know, why do I have to take the GRE? And he, he or she, I'm not quite sure uh, based on the name who it, you know, who it was, was just lamenting the fact that he or she had to take the GRE. And certainly this isn't actually relevant for me getting into graduate school, is it? And, and we kind of went back and forth on that a little bit. But at the end of the day, you know, my kind of solution to that or my answer to that is uh, it doesn't really do you any good to complain about it because it's required. You know, at the end of the day, your goal, your objective is to get as good a score on the GRE as you can to get into the graduate school of your choice so that you can move on to the next chapter. And the GRE, unfortunately, is part of that application process. You know, a, there's actually a blog up on the Accepted blog. So go to accepted.com, head over to the blog. And, and I've actually written some reasons why I think the GRE is relevant. But more than trying to convince you that the GRE is relevant, really the question is, what does it mean for your preparation? Because it is a hurdle that you have to overcome. We want to get a good score so that you can not only get into school, for some of you, it might mean scholarship money. You know, that's what happened for me. Here's a picture of me when I was kind of at my first corporate job. Linda mentioned I came back from the Peace Corps and I took my first corporate job in PR and marketing in Washington, D.C. And a couple of years into that job, I realized that for me to get where I wanted to go in my career, for me to go to the next level, graduate school was going to be something I needed to do. And as I started to look at what I needed to do to get into graduate school, lo and behold, just like you guys, realizing that I would need to take the GRE. So I embarked on the same journey that you're on, you know, starting to study and what do I need to do? Do I need to take a course? What books do I need to use? How do I, how do I prepare for this thing? All questions that I'm going to answer today in this webinar, but I did I did what I needed to do. I ended up getting a great score on the GRE, and while I was in graduate school, I ended up teaching the GRE for a local test prep company uh, based out of Denver, Colorado. And and so here's me in a classroom, kind of teaching back in my grad school days. But I had this realization as I transitioned from learning how to take the GRE myself to teaching the GRE that at the end of the day your goal is really just to get a high score. You know, the GRE is a means to an end. Your goal is not to become an algebra major or like a math guru or get the world's richest English vocabulary, although certainly that stuff will help you on the GRE. But the GRE is a beatable test. It's a reasoning test. It's that means to an end. And I'm not going to try to suggest that it's much more than that, but it's something we have to do well on. And so my goal, and what I do with all my students is I focus on teaching you how to get those right answers. And so that's the mindset that you want to adopt as you embark on this GRE journey is not to get overly academic. Yes, there are things you need to learn, and I'm going to go over that tonight, but there are also strategies and ways of reasoning your way to right answers and, and picking low-hanging fruit and getting right answers so that you can ultimately get that score and move on to grad school and beyond. So 
So let's step back. And for those of you who are just kind of embarking on your journey, the 30,000 foot view, what is the GRE? Stands for the Graduate Record Exam. And basically it just tries to measure your verbal, mathematical, analytical, and writing skills that you have developed over time. It's all stuff that you should have already been exposed to in your academic career. Now, for some of you, it might have been a long time. I actually get a lot of students in their late 30s, 40s, 50s even. I had a student recently in his 70s who was looking to go back and get a PhD in like microbiology or something like that. He worked on the, the genome project and all this stuff. And anyway, really smart guy going back to, to graduate school again in his 70s. So it might have been a long time since you've seen some of this stuff. I often joke that you might have been better equipped to do well on the GRE, at least the math portion, the day you graduated high school than you are today because a lot of the math tested is just basic high school math but it's also a reasoning test and this is where that shift of mindset comes in that we need to adopt a reasoning mindset when we attack the gre on both the quant and verbal side by the way it is an exam as i mentioned used for admission to graduate and business school and now law school as well your score is good for five years so some of you may be saying you know what i have the time to go ahead and get the gre out of the way i don't plan on applying for a couple of years that's great you know get a score get it in your back pocket and use it whenever you're ready a lot more information at ets.org forward slash gre that's a website that you should bookmark at least until you're done with uh, your admissions process and i'll come back to that link a little bit later as well I want to review the format of the GRE for those of you who are just getting started, but I want to also talk about scoring because there are some very tangible, practical strategies that you need to employ when you think about the scoring of the GRE. So this is like, this is gold right off the bat for you. I mean, I'm going to share with you some stuff just right out of the gate about how to navigate the GRE itself, understanding how it's structured and how it's scored, even before you start answering any questions to put yourself in the best position for success from a scoring standpoint. So stick with me, I'll get to the scoring here in a second before we get into the kind of the weeds on some of the strategy and content review. Um, but basically you're in store for a four hour exam. So you're gonna show up, you're gonna answer some administrative questions and then you have about four hours of pretty intense verbal, quantitative and analytical writing review. You're gonna always start with the two analytical writing essays, and then you're gonna have some combination of verbal and quantitative sections, four scored sections, and one experimental section that could be either verbal or quant. You don't know which section it is. It could be first, it could be second, it could be last. You have no idea. It's gonna look just like all the others. So don't lose any sleep over it. Don't try to figure out if it's the experimental section. You have no idea. So just do the best you can on every single section. But you know it's kind of annoying to realize that you're gonna spend about 30 or 35 minutes on a section that won't even count. <laughs> but like I said, you gotta play the game. It is what it is. We can't cry about it. So just realize that that's part of it. So here's a kind of a hypothetical format. Maybe you get verbal first, then quant, then verbal, then experimental, then quant. Uh, the point is simply to show you that the verbal sections are 30 minutes, the quantitative sections are 35 minutes. And again, you're looking at about four hours worth of GRE. They do give you a few breaks, so hey, they're, they're nice, right? Use those breaks to go drink some Gatorade, uh, you know, go to the bathroom, whatever you need to do to make sure your blood sugar is up so you can stay focused and engaged for the full four hours. And I'm actually going to talk about that when we talk about practice, preparing yourself for the mental grind that is the GRE. In terms of scoring, you get a score from zero to six on the analytical writing section. The two essays give you that combined score. You know, this is where uh, maybe I need to be careful with my wording, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe Linda can kind of chime in on the question and answer part from a consultant's perspective. My experience in talking with admissions officers and just knowing what, um, you know, what schools generally look for, they're not usually as concerned with your writing score as they are your quote unquote main verbal and quantitative scores. So those are kind of the all important scores that you're trying to get uh, that the schools are looking for on that scale from 130 to 170. Sometimes schools will kind of aggregate them and say, hey, we're looking for you to score 300 or higher you know, combined or 310 or higher combined. That's the score they're talking about, that verbal and quant score. Now, certainly depending on what kind of graduate program you're applying for, 
they may place more emphasis on the writing, so I'm not telling you certainly to ignore it. You need to get a respectable score, but the verbal and quant is where you really want to spend most of your time and attention. So let's talk about the scoring a second. Um, and actually, let me back up, and I'll actually go back up a couple of slides. One of the things about the way the, the GRE is scored is that it is adaptive in nature. So look at this hypothetical format, and you see that you're going to take a verbal section first, then a quantitative section. And the way it works is that how you do on those first of each sections dictates how difficult your next verbal and next quantitative section is. So it's adaptive in that way. If you do well on your first verbal and quant section, you will get a harder next verbal and quant section. You may be thinking, well, why, why do I want a harder section? Well, because the harder it is, the better your score is going to be. That shows them that you have gotten right answers on average difficulty questions. And the very fact that they're giving you harder questions, even if you get some of them wrong, your score kind of elevates to a higher level. So we want to do well on those first couple of uh, you know first couple of sections to set yourself up on a higher trajectory from a scoring standpoint. Point ultimately, you don't have a whole lot of control about that, right? You just answer the questions that pop up on your screen. You do the best you can. Again, don't try to figure out if the next section's harder or easier. Just do the best you can with every question up on your screen. But here's what you do want to do. You know, part of doing well on the GRE is certainly content knowledge. Um, how you actually answer the questions. I'm going to talk about that. But part of it is the strategy of taking the exam as well, your time management. And a lot of times I'll get kind of emails or inquiries from my students who say, you know, I, I'm struggling to answer all of the questions in the allotted time. I'm running out of time. Help me with the time management. How do I get better at the time management? And, and some of you who maybe fall into that category of, hey, you've been studying for the GRE for a little while. Maybe you've taken some practice tests and that's your deal as well. Or maybe you've taken the real GRE and that was a struggle for you. I have some good news for you. You should never actually run out of time on the GRE if you navigate the sections the right way. And here's what I mean by that. The beauty of the GRE, unlike one of its counterparts, the GMAT, if you're applying to business school, uh, you may be taking the GRE instead of the GMAT. Maybe that's why you're here learning about the GRE. Um, you can't skip questions on the GMAT, but on the GRE, it's a beautiful thing because if you're not sure about a question, you can mark it. You can skip it and you can come back to, to it later, time permitting. And so what that means is, there's no reason to spend too much time on a question that you immediately recognize is a question that you may have difficulty with. Maybe you don't even understand the word problem at the outset. Maybe you struggle with one of the reading comprehension passages. Maybe you read a sentence that has really hard vocabulary and you hardly know what any of the words mean on the verbal side. Maybe you know you're not good at probability questions on the quant side, and a probability question pops up on the screen, that's okay. Go ahead and mark it. Go ahead and save that time. Save it for questions that you have a better chance of getting right. You can always come back to it later. So basically what should happen is you should move through those 20 questions pretty, you know, at a pretty good pace. Go ahead and mark the questions that are a struggle for you. Work on the questions you know you have a good shot of getting right. So what happens is you get to the end of the section, You've answered every one of the 20 questions that you know you have a good shot of getting right. So at this point, you know, you've gotten right in as many right answers, you know, as at a minimum as you're likely to get. And now you're playing with house money with the remaining time that you can go back and work on the questions that you marked and wanted to spend a little bit more time on. As opposed to maybe question number five is a question that's a little bit challenging and you sit there and you bog down on it and you spend five minutes on it. You may or may not even end up getting it right because it's a challenging question for you. And now you've sacrificed time that you could be using on question 18, 19, 20 later in the section, but you don't even, 
you don't even end up with enough time to ha to spend working on those final questions, but you might have been able to get them right. Maybe they were in your wheelhouse. Maybe they're questions you're good at, et cetera, because you, again, wasted too much time early on the section bogging down on a question that you could have just got that you marked and moved on. So does that make sense? I hope I hope that concept makes sense. And that's really an eye opener for a lot of students who kind of didn't realize that that's something they can do. So I call it the picking the low hanging fruit strategy, where on that first pass through, pick the low hanging fruit, then come back. Now, of 20 questions, you don't want to be skipping like 10 of them, right? So that's where we need to prep. I need to make sure you're, you know, good and well versed and have good strategies for, you know, a large percentage of the questions. I don't want you, you know, if you're skipping half the questions, we need to do a little bit better on your prep, right? But it's okay if you have two, three, maybe four questions that look like they might stump you a little bit. That's okay. Come back to them and work on them as you have a little bit more time at the end of the section, right? So pattern recognition and quick decisions become important. That's a big part of what you're wanting to do as you're preparing is learning what types of questions are on the GRE, having that instantaneous pattern recognition. And I'm actually gonna talk about that here in a minute with what I call a Pavlovian response, recognizing the right strategy for each type of question as they pop up on your screen. And that comes from just learning, uh, learning what those strategies are, and then practice certainly is where you develop that pattern recognition. A second strategy is to go ahead and guess at the end of the section. There's no reason not to. So whether you kind of run out of time because you didn't apply my low-hanging fruit strategy, or even if you do apply the low-hanging fruit strategy, but now you have a couple questions that you've marked and you're working on them, but they're still kind of hard and, uh-oh, I'm running out of time. I got a couple questions left. Go ahead and just guess because there is no penalty for wrong answers. All questions are valued the same within a section. And maybe, maybe it's your day. Maybe luck is on your side. You should go to Vegas and buy a lottery ticket on the way home from the exam center and just make it. You're going to correctly and that can help yourself. But there's Brent? no penalty for a wrong answer. Yeah, go ahead. Brent, excuse me. There seems to be some static and, and your sound is kind of going in and out. I don't know. Is that just me? Um, attendees, can you please raise your hand if you're also hearing some some static and, and varying quality with Brett? If it's just me, then I'm just going to be quiet again. Um, I can switch. Uh, get, uh, tell me what they're saying. They are saying that several of them are raising their hands right now. Yeah, yeah, over half. Okay, I just switched microphones. Is this better? Oh, much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, letting me know because that uh, would – not be good to go the rest of the, uh, the right. presentation that way. So no, it, was I, a, it was just the last couple of minutes that I noticed it. So Oh, interesting. I wonder what happened. Well, I apologize for that. You guys can, uh, I think this is being recorded. So if you did miss any of it, you can go back and uh, kind of listen a little bit more closely. But glad the sound is better. And I'll just continue with a second strategy where, again, there's really no penalty for guessing. So you might as well do it and improve your guessing odds. You can improve your guessing odds with learning what some common wrong answers look like. You know, that's part of learning the, the right strategy for each question type. But a lot of times there are a couple of clearly wrong answer choices that you can eliminate, even if you're not sure how to answer it. Maybe you don't know what one of the vocabulary words are or, uh, um, you know, again, it's a, a probability question. You struggle with probability. Even there, there are usually a couple of throw out, eyeball, clearly wrong answers. Go ahead and eliminate those and then just improve your guessing odds and then go ahead and uh, guess on the final few questions if you end up in that situation. So, so there's just a little bit about GRE scoring and a few strategies to, again, put you in the best position for getting right answers. But now how do we really get more right answers? Going back to the mindset, the mentality that I talked about early on. And uh, here's another quick poll for you as I go through kind of the test psychology which question types, thinking about the um, kind of the format that we talked about, which of the question types are you most concerned with? I'm always, I'm always curious about this. Are you more worried about the verbal? Maybe English isn't your first language if you're on this call, um, and that's a concern for you. Maybe it's been a while since you've seen the math, and so problem-solving quantitative comparisons are, are tough for you. So go ahead and uh, complete this poll, and let me talk a little bit about the test psychology. How do you get well versed at anything how do you master anything in life i want you to think about anything that you have learned uh, to get good at 
And hopefully that's something, right? We've all gotten good at something by this point in our lives. Maybe it's a sport, maybe it's a musical instrument, learning to play the piano, learning to play the violin, maybe learning a language. Uh, you know, I've recently learned Spanish. Um, you know, here you see a picture of a golfer on the screen. So maybe you've learned to play golf, or even if you hadn't, haven't, it's, uh, it's kind of the example I'll go ahead and use. I remember when I learned to play golf, right? How do you learn to do anything? Well, well, part of it is you have to learn what to do. And so on the GRE, that would be the content review, right? So how do you learn to play golf? How do you hold the golf club? What does each club do? How do you initiate the swing? How do you make contact with the ball? You know, you go and you learn and have somebody teach you this stuff. This is the kind of the how of playing golf, right? Here's how you grip the club. And on the GRE, it's the same thing. You need to learn kind of what to do. You need to learn the underlying content that's tested on the GRE. There's really no getting around it. Maybe you learn it from a book. Maybe you take a course. Somebody teaches you the actual content that's tested on the GRE. But what is, else does it take to get good at, again, anything? Think about anything that you've mastered. Is content review enough? Is having a YouTube video or a textbook or even instructor telling you what to do enough to get good at the piano, get good at the violin, get good at playing golf, get good at the GRE? Of course not, right? You can watch videos all day long, you can, but at the end of the day, there are some secrets, some shortcuts, some ways of getting from point A to point B more efficiently. And that's called strategy. There's strategy in golf. There's strategy in musical instruments. There's strategy in you know, languages, slang, uh, you know, ways of speaking more fluently, all of those types of things. And so too on the GRE. And I would suggest to you that strategy is actually the major differentiator between people who score really high on the GRE and those who just kind of brute force their way to a score just focused on content knowledge. Remember what I said at the beginning, your goal isn't to become an algebra expert. Your goal isn't to have the world's greatest vocabulary. Your goal is to get right answers and strategy goes a long way towards that. And then ultimately, all right, looks like problem solving. So we're gonna go through some problem solving strategy tonight in terms of the poll. Quantitative comparisons, problem solving, that's quant, right? That's math. Some of you guys focused a little bit on verbal, but more uh, interested in, in math. So interesting, very interesting feedback. Um, the final piece of the puzzle, of course, is practice, right? Somebody can tell you what to do, you can learn strategies, but at the end of the day, if you're learning to play golf, if you don't get out to the driving range and hit bucket after bucket after bucket of balls, you're not going to get any better. Eventually, you need to get on the actual course and play when you actually have a hole that you're trying to get the ball into. Same thing with learning a, a musical instrument. Same thing here with the GRE. You can watch videos, you can read a book, you can even do practice problems, but until you practice under time conditions, take full length practice tests, and then work practice problem after practice problem after practice problem, that's where, <clears throat> excuse me, where the rubber really meets the road, that's where you're going to be improved. So as you think about preparing for the GRE, you need to understand what to do in each of these three areas. And so that really goes back to the title of this webinar, right? Your three-part game plan for dominating the GRE. How do you dominate content? What content is tested? How do you learn it? What do you need to focus on? What about the strategy piece? What kind of strategies are you talking about? How do you learn those strategies? How do you apply those strategies? And what should you be doing to practice? So for the duration of our time together, I wanna to drill down into each of these topic areas so that you leave with your three-part game plan. You know what to study, you know what types of strategies to learn, and you know where and how to practice. So sound good? All right, let's go ahead and dive in and let's start with part one, content. What's even tested? On, on the GRE from a content standpoint. Well, I kind of alluded to the fact that you might have been better equipped, at least from the quantitative side, for the GRE the day you graduated high school, right? It's basic high school math. It's not even the advanced math. Now, I don't know how far you got, but it's not algebra two. It's not a lot of trigonometry, no geometric proofs, certainly no calculus. It's not even upper level high school math, right? So that's the good news. 
It's basic arithmetic, fractions, percents, decimals, ratios, statistics, probability, right? Algebra, things like quadratic equations, exponents, some word problems, geometry. Again, not the advanced geometry, but we do need to know something about triangles and parallel lines and some quadrilaterals and coordinate geometry. So, so it's not like the hardest math you've ever done, but some of you are sitting there, I know it because I've talked to you know students in your position every day, all the time, you're saying, wait a second, but Brett, even what's up on the screen is intimidating to me. <laughs> like, I hear what you're saying. I understand that this might not be rocket science, but I couldn't divide fractions right now if my life depended on it. I couldn't, you know, reverse foil a quadratic equation if somebody put a gun to my head. I forget all the rules of triangles and right triangles and parallel lines. I get it. And that's why you need to study. And that's why you need to prep. Maybe you take a course, maybe you get a book, maybe you watch some YouTube videos. But at the end of the day, this is the stuff you're going to see on the GRE. So whether that scares you or not, but here is the good news. It is all learnable. I said at the very outset, the GRE is a beatable test. This stuff can be learned, it can be relearned, it can be broken down to its basic parts. You're an intelligent human being, you can learn this stuff. You can learn the rules of a right triangle, I guarantee it, because I teach it to students all day, every day, and you can pick it up and you can figure out how to do this stuff. So, so this is what you're in store for. Um, again, no reason to sugarcoat it, it kind of is what it is. You're either committed to learning it or you're not. And I know you are because you all raised your hand at the beginning when Linda asked you if you're committed to a high GRE score. So if you are, this is the content on the quant section. On the verbal section, it is a vocabulary intensive exam. So you know there are 400 of the most commonly tested GRE words that you should know. I'll come back to that when we talk about practice because I have a little gift for you, a free gift for you related to those common GRE words. So definitely make sure to stick around to the end. But you also need to focus on things like learning meaning from context. There are a lot of strategies, speaking about the strategy side of things, that you can do to get right answers, even sometimes when you don't know what some of the words mean. So for those of you who kind of answered the poll question, saying that sentence completions are what you're most concerned with. Yes, improve your vocabulary, but let's also focus on things like keywords and road signs and ways of, uh, of getting right answers, like I said, even sometimes when you don't know what a word means. One thing you can definitely do right now, between now and test day, whether test day is a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, is increase the amount that you're reading. Read, read, read some more. Read GRE types of passages and contents and periodicals and journals and National Geographic and, and hard books that have rich vocabulary. That's how your vocabulary is going to increase. That's how understanding meaning from context is going to improve. That will help your reading comprehension. But again, lots of strategies that you can learn to get right answers on reading comp as well. Analytical writing or analytical reasoning. Some of the reading comprehension questions are of the analytical reasoning type, where it's not so much understanding what you read as understanding the author's conclusion assumptions that are being made and so you do need to learn a little bit of logical reasoning understanding parts and patterns of logical arguments is tested on the, on the verbal side and then the essays uh, carefully learning how to craft a response in 30 minutes so the, the essays aren't rocket science although some of what you need to learn on the verbal side from an analytical reasoning standpoint will help you analyze an argument in essay form you just have to practice writing that essay in 30 minutes so that's kind of what you guys are in store for from a content standpoint now I know that may seem like a lot here in a moment, after I go through part two strategy and part three practice, I will give you guys some focus areas. So especially for those of you who may not have a lot of time before your GRE, where should you focus your time? Kind of where's the most low hanging fruit? I'll talk to you about that as well. But that's what you're in store for from a content standpoint. Now part two of mastering anything, including the GRE, is the strategy. And I mentioned how strategy really is a major differentiator in terms of people who score really high and those who don't. And, and I teach a lot of different strategies, but I want to show you what I mean by strategy. There are two key what I call non-traditional math strategies or math techniques that apply on a large range of quant questions on both problem solving and quantitative comparisons by the way 
So whichever of those you're more concerned with, especially the making up number strategy, like I said, you don't always have to do things the traditional way. You don't have to become an algebra expert to do well on the quant section of the GRE. We can kind of put ourselves in position to get right answers in non-traditional ways. And that includes a strategy I call making up numbers, where instead of working in the abstract with variables, you make up numbers for those variables. Working with real numbers is often easier for students than working in the abstract with variables. And that's something you want to do on problem solving and um, quantitative comparisons. But working backwards is a great strategy as well. And here's an example I want to go through with you guys to illustrate this strategy. So I'm going to teach you the strategy right now. Uh, let's spend about five minutes teaching you a tangible, practical strategy that you can use and apply on a large range of questions, on problem solving especially, to get more right answers. So go ahead and take notes. This is where Linda said we want to move, we want to engage, we want to interact. So hopefully you have some note paper and, and a pen and you can go ahead and kind of work on this question and work through it with me. But I want to talk the mindset of of this strategy right oh no sorry this isn't the working backwards strategy this is the making up number strategy um and here's the sample question right so for some of you who are concerned about the quant section even just reading this question gave you a rash like made you break out in hives you broke out in a cold sweat you're remembering your high school algebra days and oh my gosh what have i got myself into with the gre ah Right, Jason won some goldfish at the state fair during the first week, one fifth of them died. Oh, fractions, darn it, I forgot fractions, I hate fractions. And then during the second week, three eighths of those still alive at the end of the first week. What, what does that even mean? They died and, and what fraction of the original goldfish were still alive after two weeks? And man, they don't even help you out by giving you answer choices, right? Sometimes on the GRE, on the problem solving section, there are some what are called student response questions where you don't even get the luxury of answer choices. You have to come up with the answer on your own. Oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this, right? Now, some of you might look at this and think this is an easy question and good for you, right? <laughs> but for the rest of us, this might be a little bit intimidating. Where do I begin? What do I do? What if we make up numbers for this question? What if we take this question from the abstract and make it concrete? What if we come at this question from a non-traditional way, remembering what this guy Brett on this webinar that I took through accepted taught me, oh yeah, how do I do that? How do I, how do I tip the scales in my favor? How do I get right answers even if I'm unsure of the algebra, or the math, and I've forgotten how to do this? What if we make up numbers? for any of the unknowns in the question. Well, Brett, this isn't even an algebra question, is it? There are no variables, there are no unknowns. Well, what about the term sum goldfish, right? If you were to solve this algebraically, we would let x, the dreaded x in algebra, right? Let x equal some goldfish. Some goldfish is the unknown. How many goldfish did Jason win at the state fair? Well, I don't know, x goldfish, right? And then we'll take one fifth of those and subtract it from X and then take three eighths of that. And that's a lot of fractions and a lot of X's. And hopefully I can figure out how to get to a fraction at the end of all of that. But what if we work with real numbers? What if we make up a number for the number of goldfish Jason won at the state fair? What if we work with real tangible actual numbers? So here's the strategy. That's what you want to do. You want to make up numbers. And here's a tip for you. If you're making up numbers, in this case for an unknown, the sum goldfish, if the question contains fractions, as this question does, choose a number that represents the at least a common denominator. I said the least common denominator, but really any common denominator, any multiple of, in this case, 5 and 8, because then we know the fractions will work well with that number. Now, sometimes you'll work with questions and they'll contain percents. If that happens, go ahead and choose 100 because percents work brilliantly uh, when you're dealing in percents uh, or when you're dealing with 10 or 100. But here, this question is dealing with fractions. So we're going to go ahead and use 40 as the starting number of goldfish. It'll make it super easy, as you will see, right? So now you can mentally pretend the question says Jason won 40 goldfish at the state fair. How would the question change if that were the real question? 
Sorry, I had to take a quick drink of water. What if we work the question using the real numbers like 40? <clears throat> well, here's the thing. Look at our final question. The final question is what fraction of the original goldfish were still alive after two weeks? That's your denominator. That's half of the fraction we're trying to solve, right? That becomes the denominator of this fraction. The original goldfish is 40. We just let that be the starting number of goldfish. All right, now let's work the problem. Here it says, <coughs> during the first week, a fifth of them died. Okay, well, what's a fifth of 40? 40 times one fifth is the same thing as 40 divided by five. Now, maybe you haven't seen fractions for a while, but that's how it works, right? 40 times one over five, that's 40 over five, which is eight. So what that means is that eight goldfish died in the first week, all right? Next part of the question, it says, okay, three eighths of those still alive at the end of the first week died. Ah, so what we need to do is say, okay, well then how many were left after the first week? We started with 40. Eight died, so 40 minus eight is 32. Okay, so now we know we have 32 left at the end of the first week. One, or three eighths of those died. So what's three eighths of 32? Again, 32 times three divided by eight, or a quick way to think about that is eight goes into 32 four times, four times three is 12. The point is uh, 12 died in week two. But we are asked to find what fraction of the original goldfish, the denominator 40, we're still alive, I just underlined it in red, we're still alive after two weeks. Ah, the 32 left at the end of the first week minus the 12 that just died in week two means 20 were still alive at the end of two weeks. So that's it. That is your fraction, 20 over 40. That's it. See how much easier the question becomes if we work with real numbers rather than the abstract X, the dreaded X? Could we have still gotten there? Yeah but that's a lot of algebra to learn. Let's just work with real numbers, right? Um, and I'm not, not saying you don't also need to learn some algebra. There's some algebra that you just can't get away that goes back to the content piece of things. But I hope you see, I hope light bulbs are flashing in your head and you got a big smile on your face if I could see you and you're thinking to myself, oh my gosh, maybe I can do this GRE thing. Maybe this question that when I first saw it looked challenging, wow, that's really not so bad after all, if we use a little bit of strategy and come at it from a reasoning, kind of a non-traditional way. And by the way, 20 out of 40 would be a correct answer if you input it in a computer. You could also convert it to one over two because 20 over 40 is the same as one over two. The point is half the goldfish were still alive at the end of two weeks. So that is what I mean when I talk about strategy, right? That's the making up numbers strategy. There are some different applications. There are some ways that you can use it on quantitative comparisons when we have uh, variables. But again, I want you to understand that strategy can become your friend. And you need to invest in that as much as you invest in learning the underlying content. There are some things you can do with figures, for example, understanding that on the GRE figures are assumed not to be drawn to scale. And so there are some strategy things you want to do, especially on quantitative comparisons with exaggerating or manipulating the diagram to, uh, to kind of figure out how the two categories compare, the two quantities compare. So uh, we can oftentimes use a little bit of logic and common sense, that strategy as well. Remember I talked earlier with the low hanging fruit strategy for scoring, that one of the things you can do, even if you're running out of time or you're not sure on a question, you can improve your guessing odds with a little bit of common sense. And so one thing you absolutely want to do is kind of strategize and use logic and eliminate some wrong answers to improve your guessing odds. That's part of strategy as well. It all tips the favor or the balance in your favor to hopefully get a few more right answers that at the end of the day could be the difference between the score you, you know, where you are and where you need your score to be. Even one or two more right answers can be the difference and strategy can be that difference for you. All right, the final piece of the puzzle, as we think about kind of the triad, the, uh, the three parts of success of dominating the GRE is that practice, right? So you've learned some content, you've remembered triangle rules, you've remembered quadratic equations, you've learned a bunch of vocabulary, you've learned some strategy, hopefully, and now it's time to practice, 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 practice some more. Work homework problems, practice problems, real form or practice tests. And here's the reality, real former GRE questions are the best. You know, there's lots of forums and questions online and you never know the source of those questions. Sometimes they're improperly worded. Sometimes they're just not realistic questions about kind of where the GRE is today. 
So really what you want to do is you need a source of real former GRE practice questions. The official guides put out by ETS are the best for that. When I give you the recommended resources here in a moment, uh, I'll show you some pictures and you can actually write down the titles if you don't already own the official guide to the GRE, for example. You know, that's where you want to start. Um, even you know when you think about practice tests, right? The second bullet point: you need to be taking full-length computer adaptive practice tests. And there are two free ones that you see kind of in that that third sub bullet available at ets.org forward slash gre. You should absolutely take those. Those are real former gre questions put out by the makers of the gre. The scoring algorithm is accurate. It will give you a good uh, kind of uh, just a a gauge of where you are, where your abilities are. It'll enable you to apply what you're learning from a content perspective, from a strategy perspective uh, on a real practice test. You definitely need to be doing that. Back up under the first bullet point where I say develop your mental stamina. I alluded to the fact that the GRE is a long test, a four hour exam. Part of practice is you need to train your brain to concentrate for that long. You know, a lot of students, what they'll do is, and I get it, you're busy. A lot of times people preparing for the GRE are busy. They have jobs and families and extracurricular activities and things that you're doing. And, and I get all of that. And so you come home and you're tired and you put the kids to bed and you have dinner and then you spend a, like an hour on the GRE. And that's great. You can learn a lot in an hour. But then what happens is sometimes you show up on test day and two, three, three and a half hours into the exam, you're mentally tired, you're fried. You haven't trained your brain to think and concentrate for that long. And so one of the things I recommend to my students is you need to schedule at least a few marathon you know, practice sessions. Maybe you carve out some time on a Saturday morning, on a weekend when you have a little bit more time where you sit down and you just do three hours of GRE practice. And I know that sounds terrible, but that's how you prepare for the mental stamina that you need for the GRE on test day. That helps you train your internal clock, taking the full length practice tests. Uh, like I said, two free at, at uh, ets.org. I have a few practice tests on my website as well, but you need to be taking full length practice tests. All right. So I promised to tell you where to focus, going back to the content side of things. If you're short on time or if you're just wondering where to focus your time and efforts, it is all important, but here's what I would suggest. Definitely learn and master those non-traditional math strategies I talked about, right? The working backwards, the making up numbers, the eyeballing strategy for, for figures, um, those are strategies that just yield a lot of right answers on test day. They'll enable you to get right answers even if you're not you know, an algebra expert as I've already talked about. So definitely you want to spend some time mastering those strategies. I've already talked about the importance of read, read, and read some more. That's something you can be doing between now and test day. It pays dividends on reading comprehension. It pays dividends on sentence completions. It helps with your vocabulary. So definitely increase the amount you're reading between now and test day. On sentence completions, the 400 most commonly tested GRE vocabulary words, uh, I'll get there in a second. Here, one more slide, and I, I, I promised you a little, uh, a little bonus, a little freebie that I'll tell you, so definitely focus on those high-yield vocab words. In terms of content areas, yes, there's a lot of high school math, but focus on algebra, especially the quadratic equations. They appear all the time on the quad section of the GRE. Ratios appear all over the quant section of the GRE on both problem solving and quantitative comparisons. Percents and particularly percent change, you'll see them in problem solving, you'll see them in quantitative comparisons, you'll see them in data interpretation. When you're trying to interpret graphs and charts, a lot of times they'll ask how much, like by what percent did company A's revenue increase from year X to year Y? Percent change is a huge focus area on the GRE. Common word problems, quantitative comparisons, especially involving variables, that's where you can use the making up numbers strategy on those types of quantitative comparisons. The most commonly tested geometric figure are triangles, and the most commonly tested triangles are right triangles. So make sure you understand the rules of right triangles forwards and backwards, 30, 60, 90, 45, 45, 90. Your common right triangles, you need to know those inside and out 
so that you can uh, attack those types of questions when you see them. And coordinate geometry comes up a lot on the GRE quant section these days, so make sure you know at least the basics of slopes and you know, equations of lines and things like that for coordinate geometry. All right. So with that, we are coming to the end. We're just about there. It's about time to open it for, up for Q&A. So if you haven't been typing your questions in the uh, chat area, either that means I'm giving the most thorough presentation known to man, or you just haven't started typing your questions yet. So go ahead and get those coming in and we'll field those here in just a few minutes. But let me give you some tangible resources, some recommended resources as you think about these three parts. Where are you gonna learn the content? Where are you gonna learn the strategy? Where are you gonna practice? So here are a few recommended resources for you. I talked about the official guides. You know, these are indispensable in the sense that they contain real former GRE questions. Start with the main official guide that you see pictured there on the lower right. That book is currently in the third edition. Uh, at the time you're listening to the recording, maybe you're listening to this on recording, you know, you can check to see if a fourth edition has come out. But to my knowledge, they're not coming out with a new edition anytime soon. So that's what you want. Uh, there are two supplemental guides as well with additional quant practice problems, additional verbal practice problems. So definitely use these as a good source of practice problems. Now, I promised you a bonus, a freebie, and that is my Dominate Test Prep Quizlet Classroom for the 400 most commonly tested GRE words. So in the follow-up email to this webinar, Linda is gonna be sending out just kind of a, a thank you and, and a playback link, I think, for the webinar itself, but also a link to my Quizlet classroom where I've uploaded definitions to uh, the most commonly tested GRE vocab words. Uh, just welcome to have you in that just as a thank you for being on this webinar you can use those to study you can download that app if you're not familiar with Quizlet straight to your phone to a tablet on your computer wherever you want to access Quizlet and start to learn those vocabulary words I'm also uploading bonus words above and beyond the 400 as I kind of think of them and come across them you want to go beyond the 400 words but start there so that's something you guys want to do from a vocabulary standpoint and of course, ets.org slash GRE is where you can get all sorts of additional information about the GRE. In terms of time commitment, you know, for most students, you need about two to three months to prepare anywhere between six and 10 hours per week. Most people put in between 60 and 100 hours preparing for the GRE. Now, again, if you don't have that much time, go back to what I talked about in terms of the high yield focus areas, kind of the low hanging fruit, accelerate your study plan, that's great. If you have more than three months, that's great as well. Uh, but for a lot of you, if you're thinking about, okay, what's it gonna take to learn the content, the strategies and the practice, that's really what you're looking for. And consistency is important as well. Like you wanna be doing a little something every day, especially with vocab and, uh, and reading, but even just practicing the math a little bit every day helps it stick in your mind as opposed to kind of doing nothing, you know, Monday through Friday and then trying to cram on the weekends. A lot of times you forgot what you already learned and you're having to dust off the cobwebs. And, and so try to be as consistent as you can. All right. So with that, uh, that is it. Oh, but I do, I do have one other thing I want to kind of cover with you, uh, a promotion that we're offering for those of you attending this webinar. Some of you may want to go deeper, and some of you may be thinking, you know what, uh, the idea of trying to learn all this stuff from a textbook or uh, you know whatever, I, I need help. I need, I need somebody to walk me through it. I need somebody to guide me through it. I, want, I need a course. Like I need somebody to take the guesswork out of this for me and teach me all of the content that I just talked about, all of the strategies that I just mentioned. I need practice. I need somebody to kind of help me through the process, provide feedback as I have it, answer my questions. And that's what my course does. So we at Dominate Test Prep, we have a very comprehensive, very thorough test prep course for the GRE. It's online, so you can move through it at your convenience, but it is very structured in the sense that it provides a very detailed course syllabus. It will walk you step by step through all the content review, the strategies, practice questions, worksheets, everything you need to take all of the guesswork out of preparing for the GRE. As you see here, it's flexible, it's on demand. There are different package options to meet your budget and or desired personalization. 
And I think ultimately, obviously, it's going to do all this for you. Uh, but here's one of my former students from Columbia, and, and she kind of came into it as an international non-native English speaker. And she said, you know, the, the number one thing I got, obviously, I learned the stuff and my score went up. But, but the main thing she got out of my course, she said, was I gained confidence. I gained confidence to know that I could step into test day knowing that I would do better than I was going to be able to do on my own. So I would love to have that for you. I would love to work with you if you choose to do that. And just kind of as a special promo, we're running for any of you on this call, 20% off any of the course packages, any of the full course packages, right? And so that's a significant discount. I, I think you'll find that my prices are significantly lower than most other on the market anyway. And you take an additional 20% off. Would love to have you be able to work with me. Simply use the coupon code ACCEPTED20 at checkout to save 20%. It will be valid through the rest of this month, so through Saturday, August 31st, 2019. All right? And I think that information will go out in the follow-up email as well. So right. here's my contact information. Please stay in touch whether you work with me or not. I'm here to support you, work with you, help you, answer your questions if you have any. But with that, I'll throw it back to you, Linda, and we'll field some questions for the next few minutes. Sounds great. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for... Uh, offering attendees 20% off your course. That's that's number one. We have some some really good questions here. Um, please forgive me if I mispronounce somebody's name, but I'd like to start with Taryn's question. What is the best study strategy for one week before the test, and should I study the day before my GRE? I always tell students to take the day before the GRE off. Your brain's a very interesting thing. Just like your muscles, if you work out, your muscles need time to recover. The way they recover is actually by resting. Same thing with your brain. So I always tell my students the night before the GRE, don't be cramming, don't, you know, go to the movie, open a glass of wine with your wife, your husband, whatever, like decompress, let your brain rest the night before the GRE. That said, if you're in full cram mode and you literally have hardly any time and you're trying to cram as much as you can, you only have a week, you may need to spend one of the only seven days you have to prepare for the GRE, like learning some of the stuff. So you might need to feel that out. But if, if you've been preparing at least for a little while, I highly encourage at least half a day on the last day, just completely decompress and take it off. Um, in terms of where to focus, some of the focus areas I just talked about, you know, focus on ratios, percent change, some of that stuff that I mentioned already, but some of it needs to be driven by what your weaknesses are. The way you'll know that is by taking a practice test. So if you haven't taken a full length practice test yet or recently, go ahead and do that because your results will kind of dictate where do you need work. Like if you do great on the verbal and terrible on quant and most of the questions you got wrong on quant were quantitative comparisons, focus on quantitative comparisons over the next week. So part of it needs to be a little bit of self-diagnosis based on your weaknesses, which you can learn through a practice test. Uh, but all things being equal, kind of go back to the focus areas I talked about a few a few minutes ago. Okay, great. Indra Muthu asks, most of my application deadlines are in December. Is it worth it to attempt the GRE and apply this year? I just started preparing. Yeah, so your your GR the applications are this coming December. So you still have like okay. six, five, five months or six months. Yeah, I mean definitely, I think. Well, like uh, four, yeah. I think at this point, right? Yeah, four months. In August. <laughs> yeah, you, still have, you still have you still have plenty of time. Like I said, most students only need two to three months, even if you're starting from scratch. So you know, definitely start preparing now. Use practice tests as your guide, as your gauge, you know, and start, you know, take a few of them as you're going and maybe take a practice test in late, you know, kind of late October, early November. And if you're trending in the right direction and you're feeling good about it, then stick with the December test date. There's no reason to think you can't be ready by December. Okay, great. We have two people asking about um, the essay writing part of the of the exam. Yep. Um, how to practice essay questions in GRE, asks Sochiru. And Kanisha asks, thank you, Linda and Brett, for this opportunity. I may have missed it, but what tips do you have for tackling the essay section, especially if writing may not be your strong suit? Very, very good questions. All right, so let's talk about the essay a little bit. There are two essays. One is an analysis of an issue, or an opinion on an issue, basically, and they call it the issue essay. That is an essay that everybody here listening can write. It doesn't require any pre-knowledge. It's not overly difficult to think about your opinion on a given issue. 
they choose issue topics that everybody should have some sort of a, a reasoned opinion on. They're not rocket science. You have an opinion on it. You just need to practice writing an essay in under 30 minutes. Over at ETS.org, let me uh, go back here if my screen is still shared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ETS.org forward slash GRE. Search around on there. Maybe I can find the exact link and share it with Linda. But, but they literally provide on that website every single possible essay prompt that you could theoretically see on test day. So you obviously don't want to prepare for all like 200 of them. But what you can do is you can find that page on the ETS website and just pick, like randomly pick one of them and practice it. Come up with some ideas. What side of the issue are you on? Uh, come up with some points you want to make in your essay and then practice writing it in under 30 minutes. So, so just go there and practice it. Now, for the argument essay, same thing they provide a list of like every possible argument essay prompt you might see so you can get familiar with those but there is a little bit of prep work that you need to do for that because a lot of students have never actually learned how to effectively analyze an argument how do you identify the unstated assumptions the author is making and how do you weaken those assumptions how do you tie premises to the conclusion how do you weaken conclusions because that's what you are being asked to do in essay form. So yes, writing the essay is important. Proper grammar, sentence structure, well well organized essays. You know, I actually you guys can write this down. One of the things I always tell my students is from an organizational standpoint, your goal is to write a very good fifth grade essay. <laughs> so think back to elementary school or middle school, junior high school when you started to write essays for the very first time. What did your teacher tell you? You need an opening introductory paragraph where you kind of state your thesis. Then you have three body paragraphs where you give your examples and then you have a conclusion. That's what you want to do on the GRE as well. But of course, you want it to be graduate level essays with you know, complex sentence structure and maybe some, some GRE level vocabulary words sprinkled in. But that's how you want to organize it. And that's easy to do for the issue essay. But how do you do it for the argument essay? Well, the most important part of the argument essay is learning how to analyze an argument. Now, maybe we can do another webinar at some point in the future where I literally just teach you how to analyze arguments and we talk about all that stuff. That's something you're gonna need to learn. So whether you read it in the ETS book or watch some videos or to take it in my course, like wherever you learn that, that's where you need to focus. You need to learn how to actually analyze an argument. What are they looking for? How do you weaken an argument? Like, how do you do that? And then you put it in essay form. And again, you just need to practice doing that in under 30 minutes. But all of those essay prompts that you can use for practice are free on the ETS website. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great answer. Ola asks, so one of the schools I'm planning to apply to heavily prioritizes only really looks at the quant score. So is it a good use of time to focus a vast majority of my time on quant? Yes, with a caveat how and Linda you might want to chime in on this how directly did they tell you they really only care about your quant score in reverse I had a student once um, this was actually back when I was teaching in a classroom still she came in and she said look I'm applying for a master's in English they literally told me they only care about my verbal score on the GRE so they mm -hmm. said I can literally show up and just literally guess every single answer on the quant section even if i get a score of like zero or i guess the lowest would be 130 they don't care so i'm going to only focus on verbal you know i'm, I'm basically going to get up and leave when you start teaching quant stuff i said okay that's fine so if, if they've been that specific with you then only focus on on quant but if they've kind of said well your quant's mostly important and we kind of still want a minimum combined threshold well, then you need to at least kind of hit a little bit of a minimum threshold on verbal. So I would use what they've told you as your guide. But yeah, if they've, if they've told you that, just focus on quant. Any thoughts on that, Linda? I basically, I agree with you. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I, you, I don't think any graduate school, I shouldn't say any, I don't think the overwhelming majority of graduate schools want people who, who can't, who don't know English. Okay, that, that would probably be, um, you know, yeah, good point. Yeah, that would be, I think, a, a major issue, especially if a lot of graduate schools also want you to be a TA, or if you 
you know, if they want to fund you, then they expect you to be a TA. So, you know, you don't want to just bomb it entirely. But there's no question that there are going to be programs, whether it's, you know, a master's in English or, philo uh, you know, wanting you to, uh, or ignoring the quant section or allegedly ignoring the quant section, or in highly quantitative fields where they basically ignore or don't pay much attention to the verbal section. I mean, that is true. I wouldn't entirely ignore it. Um, a relative of mine a few years ago uh, was was going for a master's in a highly quantitative field, and he, you know, struggled terribly with verbal, and he worked at it, and he worked at it, and he worked at it. He finally got the score, and, you know, his quant score was through the roof, and his verbal score was anything but. And uh, his mother called me up and said, you know, what would, what do you think he should retake? And I said, you know, did he study as hard as he could? And she said, yeah, he really did. I said, then why torture him? This is not his strength. He's applying to a program that's not in his, his area. Let him, let him do the best he could. Basically, he was accepted at every program he applied to except one, including the le leading um, universities in his, his particular field. So, um, you know, I, I think there is, there are going to be times when if you're told, like, they really don't care about this section, you can't, you don't, I wouldn't ignore that section entirely, but I would definitely prioritize the part that, that they value. You there, Brett? Yep, I don't sorry. hear you, Brett. Oh, that's okay. All I right. had it out you. No, I, 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 I agree with that. Okay, great. So at this point, I want to thank all of you for attending and participating today. Your questions were great. Uh, we really appreciate your time and attention. I also want to thank Brett Etheridge of Dominate Test Preps, uh, Brett Etheridge, Dominate Test Preps founder, for sharing with us the secrets for conquering the GRE. We're going to take your question. Well, we just took your question, so we're not going to do it again. I also want to thank him for offering 20% off the Dominate the GRE course. Again, the coupon code is accepted20. You want to just put that on the screen again one more time? And it, it's good through August 31st. Secondly, I want to remind you that the GRE is a very important step on the way to graduate school, but it's not the last one. If you would like one-on-one -on -one assistance with selecting the right schools for you, handling your weaknesses or mitigating them, telling your, helping you tell your story effectively via your applications or preparing for interviews, please check out Accepted's Admissions Consulting, which you'll find at accepted.com. If you're not ready for that, then check out our free resources at accepted.com slash grad. Um, I'd also like to highlight Accepted's podcast, Admission Straight Talk, where I either share with listeners uh, application advice or interview in admissions directors, test prep pros like Brett, or current students and alumni doing great things. And you can find that at blog.accepted.com slash listen. And with that, I just want to, again, Brett, thank you and wish you all best of luck with your applications. Have a very good evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone.